handle the uh, Manhattan DA candidates. Um, and so if you all could, you know, turn on your cameras and join us, uh, we will uh, start uh, immediately. I want to thank you for your patience. As I said, these things happen. So we got a really, people were coming from other events and it threw us a little right behind. So we thank you for being here. Um, we don't get a chance to talk to DA candidates often up here, uptown, so we really are, are excited to have you here today. So I'm going to turn it over to Dave Tom, who's going to take it from here. Sure. Thanks, Tanya. We'll, um, we'll move pretty quickly in respect with the late hour, but uh, yes, I'm a resident of Inwood as well and a member of the task force. And as with the you know prior segments, we're going to jump right in with uh, running through our candidates alphabetically. If you can each give a, a two minute introduction and you'll see we have a, um, a clock visible of one of our Zoom windows here. Uh, and if uh, it will try to keep to the, to the times to enable some folks in the chat to pose questions, which uh, some of our moderators will then uh, bring to our attention so everyone can get a chance to answer them. So uh, with that in mind, I think alphabetically, uh, Ms. Tahani Abushi is first. And, uh, oh, by the way, I meant to mention our muting, if we unmute you and then you mute yourself again, you, we have to manually unmute you. So if it's possible, if you're in a quiet spot, try to stay unmuted. If not, we'll find you and un unmute you when it's your turn. All right, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ms. Bushi. Uh, that's okay, just I'm looking for the timer. Yeah, I don't see it either. Oh, there it is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Tahani Abushi. I'm a civil rights lawyer. Um, and for the past decade, I have uh, dedicated my work to fighting against racism, discrimination, and police violence, while also representing victims of sexual assaults and children in suspension hearings. I am also uh, a board member of Community Board 10 and have been for the last few years. Um, and that has given me the privilege and opportunity to learn about um, the neighborhood in a deep systemic way, everything from noise complaints to police presence, to zoning, to public safety. Um, there are those who can give you the big headlines and are others that are sitting at the table, hearing the community come forward um, with issues and then working with uh, our local city agencies to fix them. Uh, for me, the fight for criminal justice reform is personal because when I was a kid, my father was sentenced to 22 years in prison. Um, and so my family has been on the receiving end of a decision a prosecutor has made. Um, and we fought pretty hard to fight against becoming a statistic that says we're meant for the streets. Um, and so the resiliency of my family, my opportunity to go to school, to become a lawyer, was so that I can fight to balance the scales of justice. And the whole purpose of me even jumping into the race is because like you said, Tanya, right? Is that our communities are long forgotten by this race. We are not the voices or the places that people who want to run for office for this particular office come and ask what we think is public safety and what we think about police accountability and how they can work with us on ensuring a safe and stable place for everyone to live. And so I know that there are thousands of, of, of families in Manhattan that share my story, um, but we are often left out of the decision making table. And so I wanna elevate those voices and those families and ensure we're gonna have a district attorney's office that puts no badge or bank account above the law. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Alvin Bragg, you're next. Good evening, hope you're all doing well. I am a lifelong resident of Uptown, been here my entire life, uh, know the issues of the neighborhood well. Um, and my entire career is based upon experiences growing up Uptown. Uh, as a child, I had a gun pointed at me six times, uh, three by NYPD officers during lawless stops, uh, and three by people who were not police officers. Uh, I know well the public safety challenges of, of the crack cocaine era when I grew up. Uh, it was those early experiences that caused me to go to law school um, and to frame my career. And for the past 20 plus years, I've been fighting for both uh, fairness and public safety, uh, starting out as a civil rights lawyer and a criminal defense lawyer, becoming a federal prosecutor focused on a whole range of offenses, and then ultimately going to the New York State Attorney General's office uh, and serving in a number of uh, senior leadership positions, uh, finishing up as the Chief Deputy Attorney General overseeing the office of more than 1,500. Uh, as I said, I'm a lifelong resident, so I know all of the challenges. And in fact, uh, I'm still here. A couple of weeks ago, my 15-year-old daughter heard the first uh, fireworks uh, of the season. 
uh, and said, uh, here we start again. I was uh, uh, standing on uh, the street, not the uh, where the cars are, the sidewalk, and almost got run over by uh, a, a road bike uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so I know these issues very well from current times and from growing up. I know that they've rooted in uh, underinvestment in our communities. I've worked on those investment issues. Uh, and I've also, as someone who spent time in public service, have come up with creative, non-carceral ways to address issues like this. So on untaxed cigarettes, uh, rather than incarcerate folks, when I was at the AG's office, we sued UPS and Federal Express and got back more than $100 million of untaxed cigarettes and cut down on the untaxed cigarette flow in our communities. I look forward to talking tonight. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Liz Crotty. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, sticking with it tonight. Um, I'm Liz Crotty. <laughs> I'm Liz Crotty. I'm born and raised. I'm from, actually, I'm from downtown. I'm from Stuyvesant Town, uh, born and raised there. I was a DA for six years, and I've opened up my own law practice 12 and a half years ago after two years at a firm. So for the past 21 years, I've been doing criminal justice work on both sides of the courtroom. I'm here because I think public safety matters, and I think quality of life crimes matter. I've had the fortunate experience of listening to the questions and the conversation with the borough president, and I think that these are exactly the things that we have to do. I do not have a do not prosecute list for precisely this reason, because we need to to be able to talk to the communities to find out what's going on in each and every community so that people feel safe and people get a good night's sleep because I understand what it's like with the fireworks go off. I have done, um, you know, my campaign, I started talking about public safety. In, in the, when I started my campaign, I talked about bringing back anti-crime because they are the units, they are undercover units that get off guns. They've reinstated instated anti-crime to work with hate crimes and they've reinstated anti-crime to work with Asian hate crimes. And I think that that is something that police need to be doing. I started talking about subways. Uh, I wrote an op-ed about it in January because I live on 14th Street between Union Square and 7th Avenue where there was two pushings. I saw somebody going to the bathroom on the subway one night home from work. I was like, police need to be in the subways. Unfortunately, there was a quadruple stabbing um, at, you know, 10 days later, and there was 500 more police in the subways. And coronavirus, coronavirus has hit New York really hard. I understand how hard it's hit people because my parents, my mom got sick. My dad doesn't walk that well. I was at home for two months taking care of them. My business had problems. Mm -hmm. I understand what coronavirus meant to the New Yorkers at large. And I think we need to have public safety as the cornerstone for bringing back New York bring tourists back, commuters back, the million jobs that we left. It all starts with public safety and I look forward to talking to you tonight. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Diana Florence. Hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. I am the person with the most experience in the race. I have more than 25 years experience. And what I learned starting as a prosecutor back in 1995 is if you want to understand your cases and the people that are affected by it, you can't sit in your office. You have to leave your office and go to the actual places where the things happen. So I have spent a lot of time in your neighborhood. I've worked with NIMIC sitting with tenants who were ripped off by their landlords. I've worked um, side by side with uh, many of the immigrant communities. I speak fluent Spanish, learning about wage theft and not just learning, but doing the cases. I understand having Having come up to your neighborhood throughout this campaign, that if you go there at eight o'clock at night um, on you know two um, hundred and seventh Street or on Dykeman, you're going to see a different thing. You're going to see you know scores of ATVs and dirt bikes. You're going to hear on Tenth Avenue by Dykeman houses all night the parties, and you're going to see the danger. This is something that you that you contend with every day. And frankly, I'm just going to call it out it isn't getting enough attention. Yes, there's been articles, but the fact is, the fact that the, that the police have been very sluggish to take care of it, that's something that as your DA, I will address firsthand. How am I gonna do that? I'm gonna work with the police because this is what I did as the chief of the construction fraud task force. I didn't just wait for the cases to come to me. I spearheaded initiatives. We will work with precincts and communities to address things as they are happening, not when they become entrenched. I have a deep record of doing this. It's why I have 20 labor unions supporting me, not out of connections or you know because they like me, it's because I've done the work and I will do the work for you. Thank you so much. And I'm excited for the, co the conversation this evening. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lucy Lang. 
Good evening, everyone. I'm Lucy Lang. I've run a national criminal justice reform organization, and I've served as an assistant district attorney handling the most serious violent cases in our city. I'm also a parent and a, an uptown neighbor for nearly 20 years, which means that it's getting pretty close to my bedtime because I have to be ready to be woken up at 2 a.m. to the sound of dirt bikes. But it's really, it, it's not something that we should be laughing about. It's something we have to take seriously. And I know that that it affects all of us and our children and our sleep. And I am committed to working alongside you as district attorney to address that and the scores of issues that uh, undermine the well being of all communities. Many years ago, I handled, handled a case that I have no doubt a lot of you will remember, in which two masked gunmen stepped out from behind parked cars on Upper Broadway and opened fire, hitting five people and killing one, the father of a three year old. Over the course of an 18 month investigation, I became close to the mother of the young man who'd been killed. We identified the gunmen. They were brought to trial and a jury returned a guilty verdict. The day after the verdict, I called the mother of the young man who'd been killed and asked how she felt. And she replied, I slept all night for the first time since my son was killed. But when I woke up, all I could think about were the moms of those two boys, referring to the two men who had just been convicted of murdering her son. Her largesse inspired me to create a first of its kind college and prison program to bring assistant district attorneys inside New York's prisons to work on criminal justice reforms alongside incarcerated New Yorkers. That kind of leadership has, is critical to my vision for the district attorney's office. And I'm proud that my candidacy is informed by and supported by the communities most impacted by the system. Families who lost loved ones to police violence, including Sean Bell's family. Women who suffered sexual abuse at the hands of Harvey Weinstein. Progressive prosecutors from across the country who are doing the hard work of implementing reforms. And formerly incarcerated New Yorkers who best know how to address the problems that are plaguing our communities and how to work alongside the district attorney to dismantle mass incarceration and reckon with this country's history of racial injustice. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Eliza Orleans is next. Hi, everyone. Thanks for sticking it out. I know it's a late night, and it's certainly a late night for all of us. We've all been back to back on forums. Um, but I am thrilled to be here to have these important conversations with all of you because um, these are the issues that uh, that matter. You know, the, And listening to New Yorkers is what matters. I've spent my career uh, as a public defender here in Manhattan for the last dozen years. I have represented over 3,000 people charged with crimes, and the overwhelming majority of whom are people of color, lower income people, you know, people who are LGBTQIA, people with disabilities. And I've seen the way in which over prosecution and over incarceration of people for low level offenses is something that in fact hurts people. It destroys families, it destroys lives, um, it enables people who cannot afford to buy their freedom. Um, to, it forces them to be stuck in jail while people who have wealth and power and connections um, get to be out. Um, so, you know, I find it really fascinating sitting here listening to my fellow candidates because aside from Liz Crotty, who's, who's been consistent throughout, it feels like some people are changing their message depending on who we're speaking to. You know, I don't think that the answer to noise is additional policing or additional prosecution or additional criminalization of things. I, I, I truly don't. And I've always been consistent on that. I think that, you know, involving the NYPD, sending the NYPD in to communities, especially communities of color, to deal with these issues are things that are not going to be successful or not going to help people. Um, you know, it, it actually puts people's lives in danger, potentially. I've seen it with my clients over and over and over again, and it disproportionately tar targets people. And so I'm I'm not going to change my message depending on the, the, the forum. Um, I've been remarkably consistent, not just throughout my campaign, but throughout my career as a public defender for the last dozen years. Um, and I look forward to having these conversations. Even if you wanna push back and challenge me, I welcome it. And I'm, I'm happy to be here with you even at this late hour. Thank you so much. Uh, finally, Ms. Tully for Hedy and Weinstein. Good evening, Tanya and David. Thank you so much. I don't see the, oh, there it is. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and to introduce myself to you. Like so many New Yorkers, I'm an immigrant. I came here when I was a kid from Iran to flee the violence of revolutionary Iran. And I've made my career uh, around delivering on fairness and safety for others, because I think that without fairness and safety, there is no opportunity. People cannot thrive and cannot prosper. I also spent 10 years uh, as a kid uh, struggling to become an American citizen, litigating our asylum claim. And I carry from 
that experience, a commitment to making the legal system more fair, more open, more transparent, and more working for people and in service of justice. Uh, I went on in my career to work for three attorneys general of the United States, uh, including Eric Holder, who has endorsed me. I have been a leader in city prosecution over in the Brooklyn DA's office and in federal prosecution. I have brought just about every kind of case myself. And I come to this moment ready because I think that uh, as the city recovers from this pandemic, safety is such a key component of that. People have to feel safe everywhere, in their home, in the street, in the subway, when they're meeting the police uh, and when they're reporting a crime to the police. Uh, I want to pause just on some lessons from the Brooklyn DA's office that I think are really relevant to our discussion tonight. Uh, first, prosecution does not have to mean incarceration. So our choices are not to do nothing uh, or to throw folks in jail. And we developed so many diversion programs to off ramps from the criminal justice system. I bring that spirit. Uh, I, I think that uh, we have to support law enforcement uh, sometimes if it doesn't mean our own prosecution. And and, uh, and we have to have the courage to make the hard cases. I spent the afternoon in Inwood on Saturday with Adriano Espaillat, who has endorsed me. We heard about uh, dirt bikes uh, pretty much out of every other mouth. And uh, I know how important an issue this is. And since my time is up, I hope you'll ask me some questions about it. I, I suspect we will. Uh, yeah, so. I think so. So yes. thank, you, thank you, candidates. I think what we're going to do now is we do have a lot of questions in the chat. So um, what we'll do is I'll pass it back to Tanya to identify the questions. We'll do 90 seconds for each candidate to respond. Um, and I think with, without further ado, Tanya, okay. if you want to take us into the questions, I'll call everyone out in alphabetical order going back and forth as we go. Sure. sure. Uh, we would like to have Maggie Clark ask her question. Maggie? Hi, Maggie. Hi, everybody. Um, I, you know, I understand that quality of life crimes are considered to be inconsequential and individuals can be arrested multiple, even dozens of times and released after that. Uh, can you tell me how that's a good idea for anybody? And would you continue this practice if elected? Uh, if not, uh, do you have better ideas and what are they? So with that, we're going to go reverse order this time. So uh, Mr. Hady and Weinstein, if you could go first. Sure. Uh, so I, I don't think that they're inconsequential, Maggie. And uh, this is part of what I mean about creative, about having being creative, having diversion programs and making hard choices. For example, uh, I, there are many folks here who would not prosecute uh, most misdemeanors. I do think that selling illegal fireworks to somebody else uh, is something that we should prosecute. And in general, we should be trying to stem uh, the flow of, of things that come into our communities that make everybody feel less safe and that degrade our quality of life. Uh, I also think that, you know, for some crimes where you see these kinds of cycles because of underlying issues like a mental health illness or uh, a drug addiction, uh, that's when we can disrupt with the criminal justice system. But as I said, not send people into jail, but use the system for alternatives. In Brooklyn, we had a program right off of arraignment uh, for drug addiction, for example, uh, vastly more mental health programming than exists in Manhattan. I would, uh, would bring all of that to Manhattan if elected. Uh, I think that in, you know, in each of these scenarios, we have to go into the middle and find these reasonable solutions uh, that balance our desire to be fair and proportionate uh, and also to keep people safe uh, and to deliver on the kind of safety that I talked about from the beginning. Thank you, uh, Ms. Orleans. So I understand that a lot of these crimes that are referred to as quality of life crimes are things that do impact the lives of New Yorkers. As a born and raised New Yorker, I, I completely feel that. Um, but also I think that on the, on the flip side, I know how horrific um, being involved in our criminal legal system is. And not just how horrific Rikers Island is, which is a topic in and of itself because it's you know an absolute abomination and violation of human rights and human dignity. But even being involved in the criminal legal system and having you know, these, these diversion programs and some of these things where, you know, as someone who's accused of a crime, you have to pay for the privilege of engaging in. 
these programs are, you know, continued intrusion into people's lives. They have to miss work to go to court over and over and over again, find people to watch their children, risk having warrants issued for their arrest if they miss a court date. Um, and, and, you know, I think that, that we need to be thinking about how we can invest in communities and make sure to, to engage in non-carceral solutions and prevention of these issues and not say, oh, I'm going to prosecute people for these things that are, you know, misdemeanors or violations. That's, that's not part of my plan. I don't think that that keeps us safe. I don't think it prevents crime. And in fact, when someone is involved in the criminal legal system, whether it be even just for a brief period when they are incarcerated, it makes it more likely that they will reoffend or get rearrested. It makes future contact more likely. So this cycle that you talk about in your question, Maggie, is an important one because that actually shows the criminal justice system is failing at what it's trying to accomplish. Um, not that, oh, we should be locking people up for longer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now turn to Ms. Lang. In my experience, noise violations are not resulting in incarceration, nor do I think that they should. That said, the district attorney can and must do far more than, than use the tool of prosecution alone. That is one tool that should be limited to particular circumstances. Part of what the district attorney can do is collaborate with communities to create interdiction programs and preventative problem, programs and restorative programs. And I'm invested in working alongside community members like my neighbors to identify what the issues are, what's at the root of them, and, and to try to work with folks who are, are perpetrating these kinds of problematic behaviors that undermine the wellness of everyone. That doesn't mean uh, contributing to the, the cycle of, of mass incarceration or the cycle of reincarceration, because even if someone were to be uh, locked up uh, and held briefly on a, some kind of a, a noise violation or or a discon, uh, that doesn't stem the tide long-term of this sorts of conduct. And we really need to invest in long-term, sustainable, community-based solutions. The district attorney can be a part of that without undermining the commitment to address racial injustice and mass incarceration. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Florence. Yeah, so we need to be really blunt and out quality of life crimes. I was a prosecutor in the mid nineties and I'm the only one who was a prosecutor back then. And when we, we called it broken windows back then. And when we talk about cycling people through and getting them out, that's exactly what we, we did back then. I mean, it's just the difference was that people went to jail for three days. Um, to Rikers Island and then they process back through instead of going to your corner in Inwood, they'd come down to me in the East twenties. It was the same system except we were disappearing people for days at a time. So now we're in a different situation where certain crimes are not bail eligible, but we still have the same underlying issues. So the fact is what we need to be doing about quality of life crimes and crime in general is just for once and for all, stop processing and actually asking the questions. Back in February, I stood with electeds and community leaders on 207th Street for a press conference about the stabbings, the multiple stabbings on the A train. And that, that person who committed those crimes had three open cases, much less serious. And yet no one, not the public defender, not the prosecutor, not the judge, no one in the system stopped and asked, why is this person keep coming back? So my plan is once and for all to ask those questions and then make sure that we work together, all of us in the system, we all have a stake in this and we need to be looking and asking those questions. And that's what we'll do it from arraignments. Thank you, I know I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ms. Crotty. Sure, I mean, as someone who practices in both Brooklyn and in Manhattan, diversion programs exist in Brooklyn and they've existed for a lot longer than the two years Ms. Weinstein was there. And diversion programs have existed in Manhattan for quite some time as well. So diversion programs are nothing new. What we're seeing now with bail reform is that people are getting issued desk appearance tickets from the precinct and not being brought downtown. Noise summonses, are summonses and they have to go down at one center street to answer the summons. There should, should be some gradation to all this. So if you get a noise summons the first time, fine, you get a noise summons. The second time you get a desk appearance ticket. The third time 
you get brought down in front of a judge. Doesn't mean you're going to jail. It means your deterrence level gets higher and higher for the actions that you have to do. Because I've been a defense attorney for 12 and a half years. I've kept more people out of jail than anybody on this stage. So that minus Eliza Orlitz which is probably a, a tie. But the fact is, the fact is, is that we have to, we have to say, we have to say is, is that how do we hold people accountable? Jail is not always the answer, but holding them accountable too. And there is the clarity principle where people, when they get arrested are not thinking, oh, I'm going to get 30 days or I'm going to get three to six years, depending on what the crime is. They're thinking, I don't want to spend the next 24 hours in jail dealing with this. It works. And I know it works because I've seen it from both sides of the courtroom. So I think we also have to, I'm out of time, but we also have to talk about the backlog of coronavirus and bail reform and how that affects the actions we're seeing on the street. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bragg. Yeah, so I wanted to go back to the the, the, the first uh, answer that, that, that Tali gave about illegal fireworks and kind of talk about how I would approach that differently based upon my, my court experience and my personal experience. So I would not arrest the... Uh, uh, the person, I think, so the kid who's you know selling the illegal firearms. I think we've we, we've seen that. That's that's what happened before. That's my entire youth. I had friends who were arrested for that. Um, it, it's it, it doesn't it doesn't work because that kid. There's a million of them. Um, and you know, I didn't say kids. Okay. 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 I'm okay. So so person. I'm sorry. I apologize. Adult person. Adult person. I apologize. I, I misheard. Okay. Um, uh, but but in any event, so the person that person will be replaced. In my experience. Growing up, it generally was a kid, but will be replaced, you know, by the evening by someone else who's going to do that. My theory of prosecution, which I've done my whole career, is you follow the money and you follow the contraband. So, you know, the fire, the fireworks, they're coming from a truck. You write the, the license of the truck of, of the truck down. You you cut a grand jury subpoena. You follow it to the warehouse. You go to the warehouse. You follow the money and the contraband. And you go to the source and you cut that off. That's how you get true enduring public safety, and it's also how you avoid all the collateral consequences. I've had the Warren Squad knock on my door at 5 a.m. looking for a relative who used to live with me who had an open warrant for an open bottle. It, 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 this affects entire families and it doesn't bring safety. So we need a new approach. So since our mics are always on, I, now this is dangerous, right? I also said stem the flow. Obviously we all want to stem the flow of the contraband coming in also. I do want to, I do want to keep going because we have a lot of stuff to cover and I know it's super late. Um, Ms. Bushi, you're, you're next. I'm considering this a sleepover. So this is, not, this is as exciting as it gets for us candidates, okay? Um, so let me just say this. I live between PSA 6 and Jackie Robinson Park. And Jackie Robinson Park turns into a club after 8 p.m. with the speakers, the barbecues, the double park cars, the craziness. And uh, last summer when the fireworks were going off, I couldn't open any of the windows in my small apartment because it was back to back, back to back fireworks going off. And at some point when I was going to the supermarket on 145th, I remember coming back and watching the cops watch the fireworks go off. And so there's two sides to this. One, here where we live in Harlem and Washington Heights and in Woods, there's heavy residential areas. There's a lot of children here. We have a bunch of schools here, parks. The pandemic has exacerbated the situation where there's just nowhere else for them to go. So in response to the fireworks, yeah, let's track where it's coming from. But if we're meaningfully going to enforce it, right, which means just confiscate it, take it away, then we have to make sure that we got our community leaders, our families, the PSAs that are going to not just watch by and, and enjoy the fireworks, but say, you know, we can't be doing this here. Um, and I think in terms of the bikes and the ATV, same thing around seven o'clock or 4 p.m. a couple of times a week, the whole trail comes by down the avenue, down Frederick Douglass. Again, nothing's really done about it. And I think that the NYPD wastes a lot of money confiscating them um, and ends up returning it to the owner. So I think the goal is to find a place to park these on private property and make sure that they're not using them in the city versus posting officers everywhere uh, and confiscating them from the people. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna go back to Tanya for the next question. And then yes. Ms. Abushi, I'm gonna uh, go back to you to start the answers. Yes, this is a really good question posed by Amy Stern. 
Um, uh, I'm going to read it for her because I don't think she wants to say it live. <laughs> but this, she said, this chat is clearly split between people who think noise needs to be more criminalized and people who believe it needs to be handled as a non carceral community issue. I'd like to hear each candidate talk about which aspects of our quality of life issues need the involvement of the NYPD and the DA's office and which should be solved without. And so to Mr. Bushi for the first answer. It depends what you consider a quality of life issue, right? Here, what we're talking about tonight are the dirt bikes, the ATVs, fireworks, and noise. I think those are largely issues that need to be governed by a civil body. It's something that we deal with in our community board 10, uh, and I'm sure community board 11 deals with it and community board 12 um, on why it's ongoing. I think that this is an opportunity for businesses that have a lot of noise coming out of there when they come up for their SLA renewals that we make sure that they're addressing those noise complaints. That if there are families that, that are out barbecuing and blasting music that we put a curfew on that and say, you know, let's respect uh, the residents and have a cutoff time if the ordinance permits uh, the ordinances, um, whether it's a 10 o'clock cutoff, 11 o'clock cutoff on the weekends. Um, to try and find that peaceful medium where the children and families can enjoy their neighborhoods, but then the very same people can also enjoy, enjoy the peace and quiet. Now, when it comes time to violence, when it comes time to um, ensuring that uh, there are resources in the community that we are preventing crime, that we're not just automating the system and having this revolving door uh, of people coming in out of, uh, of our system. This is the opportunity to invest resources, to come into our community leaders, our community boards, our neighbors, uh, and get them at the decision-making table to find what is and what isn't working and where we can alleviate these low-level offenses um, with more resources. Thank you. And next, we're going to go to Mr. Bragg. Yeah, so look, I, I, I would add a third category. So I think for me, a lot of this is community-based responses. Uh, so that, that's, I think, the lion's share for me. Then there are some things that I think rise to a level of public safety issues. So some of the hazardous driving uh, that I've seen uh, that, that certainly could result in death or injury, I think is something uh, that could require public safety policing response. Uh, but I think there's a third uh, a response, which is the use of government power that's not incarceratory. And that's what I was referring to uh, when I was talking about the case we did with Federal Express and UPS. I mean, the NYPD made a decision to go corner to corner and arrest mostly Black men for selling untaxed cigarettes. I've been uptown my entire life. I've, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's annoying to some, um, but not a public safety issue. You know, Eric Garner, for one, died. There were tons of collateral consequences. And the problem wasn't solved. Uh, but we use our civil power and, and as district attorney, as someone who has been in the city council as a staffer and worked at the attorney general's office, I would collaborate with those partners. Uh, and, and like I said, we sued Federal Express and UPS and we brought real change. We got the tax money back, won $100 million, and we took the contraband, the untaxed cigarettes off the streets. So I think there's a very important sort of third lane there, if you will, which is the use of government power that is not criminal, uh, administrative, civil, and having worked in the city council in the attorney general's office, I think I'm well situated uh, to help coordinate that uh, with partners in government. And I also want to apologize. I, I, I'm going to have to, I don't know if I'll be able to make it to the end for some family child care commitment. So I apologize if I, if I fall out. Understood. Uh, Ms. Crotty. Yeah, I think we have to look at it, you know, from where we are. And I think that when you look at criminalizing, um, I think you have to have, I'm endorsed by um, the sergeants, detectives, lieutenants, detectives former Commissioner Ray Kelly, uh, working with law enforcement. I think we have to look to law enforcement. I think we have to look to law enforcement and community policing um, and work and working within the community um, for the police to work with the community that they know. I think there was a very interesting article in the New Yorker about the 73rd precinct and how uh, policing and who the policing commander is affects things. And I think that we have to talk about that. But I also think we can Grade, grade these levels up. So when you have known issues uh, and the police being involved, you can do a summons the first time. You can do a desk appearance the second time. You can maybe, um, if somebody has an open case and is continuing to do this, then you can bring them down to, in front of a judge. So I think that people have to say, okay, fine, the first time 
you know, shame on you. Second time, shame on us. And what are we doing this? And how is it affecting the neighborhood at large? So I don't think it has to be a first blush, everyone goes in, but I do think there is a projection to these things and people have to be held accountable and people have to stop. And if they don't stop with the summons and they don't stop with the desk of parents ticket, then maybe they stop with a full arrest and going in front of a judge. And I think that that's the appropriate way to handle that with the police. I'm the only person on this group who doesn't have a do not prosecute list because, and I never have, because I think it's working with the police and the community to have fairness across the board. Thank you. Uh, and with those dulcet tunes, we'll move to Diana Florence. Yeah, look, I, I think that we have to be, again, really clear about what's criminal and what's not. And, you know, as much as I applaud what Mr. Bragg did at the Attorney General, we don't have civil enforcement powers at the DA. We can't sue companies. Um, we need to be looking at, you know, indictments or we need to be working with police and we can work together. And, and, and for me, noise Frankly, for the most part, noise in and of itself is not going to rise to the level of the DA's office. However, again, I've been to your neighborhood. I've almost been run over by bicycles on the sidewalk. I've heard those complaints from talking to person after person, whether it's on Fort Washington or over on uh, Nagel. I mean, it doesn't matter. This is the same thing that is happening. And that, frankly, if you have dirt bikes, bicycles, uh, ATVs riding on the sidewalk, that is that is frankly a misdemeanor that I would very happily prosecute because we need to be incentivizing that type of behavior to stop. And by the way, it's not just happening in your neighborhood. It's happening all over the city. It's happening in my neighborhood. It's happening on the Upper West and Upper East Side. And it is terrifying people. So again, we need to be very clear about what's criminal and what's not. If things are properly civil, um, I agree with Mr. Rag. Yeah, we should be partnering with other agencies, but, but we're Referring them. That's not the DA's job to be enforcing noise ordinances, but I do think the community can be doing that together with the community board and the borough president who just came on in your, and your city council members. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lang. I've responded to this scene of fatal vehicle crashes and seeing people flattened on the pavement by by vehicular violence. There is no question that some of the kind of conduct we're talking about here can result in acts of violence and there are appropriate law enforcement responses. That said, I do think that that is not the appropriate response in any number of the noise complaint type issues we're talking about here, but that the district attorney can still play a really important role in creating other pro-social supportive responses. Some of the ideas outlined in the task force's wonderful recommendations really potentially serve that function. I love the idea of a noise czar, for example, and can imagine that the district attorney could direct resources towards and partner with the noise are in doing things like identifying the response time to 311 complaints, in creating tracking to determine what the uh, 911 response rate is and what the, the reaction is, and then, and then aggregating that data and working with other agencies to figure out the appropriate response and how things should be funded to, um, to try to, to intervene. Um, I also think that the idea of of increasing speed camera enforcement with hands-off ticketing is really promising in a way that calling upon the police to respond when we know that there are potential, um, potential really negative long-term consequences of increased policing is problematic and needs to be taken into consideration in making any decisions on these issues. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Orleans. Um, so I think I'm, may need to take a different tack on this question because I think that when we talk about the quality of life issue, we have to expand what we're referring to as quality of life. We have to talk about what quality of life means to everyone who lives in New York City. And that means not just being um, free to exist, but, but being free to exist you know, without the threat of police violence, let's say. So the quality of life for black and brown New Yorkers, you know, extends to, um, you know, the over policing and, and the way in which the police interact with certain communities. It's why I've called for, for example, the, the disbandment and abolishment of the vice squad. They have been one of the most dangerous squads, um, you know, save anti-crime who has already been disbanded, but, but the vice squad who has terrorized and harassed and assaulted um, and sexually assaulted, uh, you know, particularly uh, 
sex workers and trans women of color. And, and I've seen it time and time again with my clients. And, and so, you know, I think that when we talk about quality of life issues, it can't just be limited to the things that, you know, are typically thought of. And so of course we do need to deal with these things, but I do think that we need to come up with non- law enforcement solutions to them, non-carceral solutions to them. And I don't think that the district attorney's office should be the primary enforcer of certain things that are not, you know, issues that are, that, are, that should be criminalized. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Farhadi and Weinstein. Yes. Uh, so let's break it down into three categories. I think that there are some things like noise uh, that should not be a criminal issue and should be dealt with with fines. Second, I think there are some crimes here that we ought to prosecute. Uh, I talked about the selling of the fireworks. Uh, when I was with Congressman Espaillat uh, on Saturday, and we went to the gas station near Dykeman. Uh, the owner told us about uh, folks with the bikes who came in the night before and so were siphoning off gas from his pumps uh, for, you know, to feed these bikes. We should be prosecuting that. I'm with Diana about uh, the bikes that are being driven on sidewalks and are an actual safety threat to people. And then there's a third category where we in law enforcement have to be supportive of solutions uh, in which we can play a part. So, and you, and you have proposed some of these ideas yourself. So setting up checkpoints to figure out uh, where the bikes are coming in from and where they're being sto stored. Uh, how are they being bought and sold? Uh, is that a legal activity? Uh, we should advocate to have licenses on them so that we can keep track of where they are and who they belong to. Uh, and I think uh, this is the hard work, is knowing that there is not one answer for all of these things, but that public safety is the way we sort into these categories. Thank you. I think what we're gonna to try to do is squeeze in one uh, last question, maybe with 60 second answers, and then we'll get right to our closing statements. So uh, Ms. Farhadi and Weinstein, you'll go first after Tanya posits our last question. Sure, um, this is a, a really good question. Um, how would you use the resources of the DA's office to investigate the explosion of temporary license plates, which tends to correlate with vehicles contributing to noise and safety issues? How will you investigate these uh, vehicle license, this vehicle license plate activity? Uh, it, it's a great question, Tanya, and it piggybacks off of what I was just talking about before, and in a way, some of the themes that we've been talking about all night, because uh, some of these problems uh, really can be stemmed at the source. I don't think people are making up these license plates themselves. Uh, they are coming from sources where they're being produced en masse uh, and are, are going out there into the stream, and so if we can cut them off at the pass, I think that can go a long way, and on, you know, in general, we should be on the side of regulation that allows us to track things that are dangerous in our communities, whether it's these bikes or it's this is why guns have serial numbers on them, right? Uh, tracking is important. Uh, and this is about building up investigative capacity inside the DA's office. Uh, thank you, Ms. Orleans. So I think that Yes, the DA should be tasked with issues of public safety um, and making sure we're keeping New Yorkers safe. But um, in terms of proactive investigations um, into fake license plates, you know, I don't know whether that necessarily should fall within the purview of the district attorney's office. It sounds like something that's more well suited to be done within the attorney general's office. But, um, you know, I'm sure Mr. Bragg will weigh in if he's still on this call. I'm not sure if he if he dropped off. But but, you know, this is something that, again, like the additional criminalization of things and of people, because who's good, who's it going to hurt? I can tell you because the people who are making the license plates or who are selling the license plates are not going to be the ones who ultimately get arrested, get prosecuted, get incarcerated for these things. It's going to be, you know, the same people that I've spent my career representing as a public defender. It's going to be lower income folks. It's going to be black and brown people. It's going to be people who were just trying to get around, who were just trying to, you know, the people who were making the license plates who end up getting prosecuted again are going to be people who were doing that at, at, at essentially like you know, poverty wages. Um, so they shouldn't be the ones being prosecuted or criminalized either. Um, thank you. I'll that. All right, thank you so much. Ms. Lang. I want to understand this issue much better and think about it 
collectively in determining what the appropriate solution is. So I'll give you an example of how I think about problem solving that I hope will be illustrative of how I intend to approach problems. We received a letter at the district attorney's office many years ago uh, saying from anonymous concerned tenants of a housing complex that said, we are concerned about narcotics trafficking that's overrun our community. There was a murder on the playground. And so I built a long-term investigation into this narcotics trafficking. We worked our way up the chain to two brothers who were moving hundreds of thousands of dollars of angel dust through this complex a day and using children as young as nine years old to act as lookouts to protect their, their drug uh, narcotics dealing. They, there was a murder and a number of shootings in and around the playground. And at the conclusion of the investigation, the folks said to us after we arrested them, thank you so much, but what now? And I realized that the traditional tools of prosecution were not enough and that we had to bring together NYCHA, the Parks Department and others to try to solve the core of their problems. And we worked together to do just that. And that's how I would approach this kind of problem. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Florence. So we can do this at the district attorney's office. We can work with auto crimes, which is part of the NYPD. I know this because I actually did an international motorcycle and car trafficking ring where they were stealing high-end motorcycles. And part of what they were doing there was using fake license plates. And it was part of the ring. And this is something that is citywide. It's not low-level people being, being paid low-level wages. These are organized rings. And the way we were able to prosecute that case, it started with one motorcycle. And it it ultimately ballooned into several hundred and more than 30 defendants. Why was that? Because again, we, we started to pull the string. We used investigative tools. As your district attorney, I will do that. I understand that those license plates, that's obviously not the major crime. That's the symptom. That is part of the bigger problem. And when it comes to, well, I, like, I like the idea of what, what Tali said about the, the tracking uh, of these bikes. The fact is they're not legal in New York. They're not, they're not allowed to be on on roads, so they're not VIN numbers. So in order for us to do that, it has to go at the legislative level. That's something I would advocate for. But again, we have to be honest, they don't belong here in the first place. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Crotty. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to, it starts with reckless driving, um, which is a misdemeanor that you can charge. And I think it is also when you have fake license plates, I have worked on defending cases with people with like fake license plates, which is a ring. Most of the, and much of what Diana Florence said, most of these kinds of cases, they are not one-offs. They are rings of criminal behavior where you can go and investigate. The district attorney's office has not only works with the NYPD, they have their own investigative um, division where they can go and investigate these cases, build a case from the ground up to really prosecute the people at the top who are doing these types of activities. And I think that the district attorney's office used to be very well known for doing investigations and, and complex investigations, not just license plate in, in all different assets. And I think that that's something that we really have to look at the investigatory capacities of this office and bring it back so that it has a trickle down effect too to the lower level crimes that we are seeing. And also too, you have to work with law enforcement to, to combat these things. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bushi. I just wanted to make sure I understood the initial question. It was about temporary licenses being issued, not fake the, licenses, right? Uh, pa paper license plates used illegally, but they have real VIN numbers and real, they're real license plates, but they're used as a way to get around a number of factors and correlate with noise and dangerous driving. Um, so I think one way we can do uh, is trace it back to the DMV that is issuing these fake license plates or these or these license plate numbers that are connected to VINs, if you're saying they're actual license plates, paper ones that have actual VIN numbers, um, and then go back to the source of how it even came to be, why was it issued, where did it happen, um, and get it off the street, whether that means impounding the vehicle um, until all that stuff is rectified, like that happens if you park somewhere near uh, um, the uh, West Side Highway. Um, and I think it's also important that, you know, the public advocate is proposing an alternative to calling 911 um, to ensure that issues like noise complaints, um, illegal vehicle um, license plate, the paper license plate, whether it's the ATVs uh, and the dirt bikes on the road, 
that once you call the this alternative number, I think it might be 311 or maybe 411, that it will connect you with the city agency that should be dealing with it and can help you follow through with your complaint as opposed to just calling in and goes into an abyss and there's just no follow up. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your answer. I think we're now going to do uh, 60 second closing statements. We're going to again go back to Ms. Bushi. Sorry, let me unmute you there. Um, and then I'll just call on everyone for their uh, final minute. But thank you again uh, for everything tonight. And after closing statements, we'll go back to Tanya for the, the grand finale. Yeah, well, uh, thank you so much for hosting this forum for so many different offices throughout Manhattan. Um, I know it's been long on your end. All we had to do is really wait. Um, and it was an honor to hear you really grill the borough presidents, the city councils, because we have an opportunity to make sure we're electing people that across city offices are gonna work together to address our issues. Um, as someone that lives in Harlem and that has felt long ignored by all of the offices that you grilled today, um, I thank you for advocating on behalf of Washington Heights and Inwood residents to bring those resources up here, to bring accountability up here to, to make sure our voices are represented. That's why I jumped into this race. Um, we are not communities that are broken or that need saving. We are communities that need that dignity and respect and attention that other uh, privileged communities uh, enjoy. And so this is the important part is where we elevate these voices and ensure that we're going to make a district attorney's office that is transparent, accountable, and collaborative with the public. Thank you so much. Uh, over to you, Ms. Crotty. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's been a real pleasure. You know, I'm here because I care about New York, um, and I think everyone here who's on this call at this hour cares about New York and how we live here in, in everyday life. I'm here because I'm an everyday New Yorker, and I understand to run this office fairly, how to run it from the top as someone who knows what happens on the day-to-day -day level. And I also think that we have to work with communities, communities like yours, communities across Manhattan, where you can have an active voice in the DA's office and with law enforcement and with the district attorney's office so that we can all have one voice to be combating the problems that affect every neighborhood. In every neighborhood, it's different, but in every neighborhood has problems. The district attorney's office is here for your neighborhood, the police are here for your neighborhood, and you guys are here for your neighborhood. I wanna be the leader who works with all three so that we can all get a good night's sleep uh, tonight and then the nights to come. So thanks for having me. Thank you, uh, Ms. Florence. Thanks again for having me as well. This was great. It's always excellent when we get to talk about one particular issue. And, and I think that the particular issues that are affecting Uptown are affecting other neighborhoods. And it's important for the whole borough to be hearing about our positions on this. So again, I am here as the most experienced. I've done this work in the actual office I wanna lead. And you, as you heard tonight, I understand the way to start, to start on day one attacking these issues. It's not about criminalizing things that shouldn't be. I'm so glad you had borough presidents and city council members beforehand. Some of those noise issues are very properly dealt with on that level. There are some times where noise is accompanying dangerous conditions and that's where we can be part of the conversation conversation and in fact hold people accountable that violate their positions and, and, and endanger our communities. I will be your district attorney who holds those people accountable. I've never been afraid to stand up to power and I will be in the community, not just when I'm running for election, but all the time. That's what I did my whole career. Thank you so much and, and please stay in touch. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lang. My colleagues and I are joining you from a forum hosted by Young New Yorkers, an alternative to incarceration diversion program out of Brooklyn for young people that uses the arts and art therapy as an alternative to keep kids out of the criminal justice system and keep them from getting records. And I keep coming back to this young woman who shared in a very raw way her experience of being chased and arrested for painting graffiti and, and then held uh, for a long time in a police precinct and the trauma that it brought her and actually continues to bring her that she lives through. And so I really am, am I have that top of mind as we're thinking about these issues. And as a neighbor who is deeply committed to making sure that all of our families are safe and
has responded to crime scenes uh, for many, many years. I also want to bear in mind that it has to be tempered by the human beings on both sides. And that's why we have to work together to build solutions that are non-punitive, that are diversionary, and that don't see prosecution as the sole response. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Orleans. Thank you all for staying so late and thank you for having me tonight and hosting such an important conversation. I know that everyone on this call does want a safer New York. It's certainly what I want. Um, I am a born and raised Manhattanite. I will die in Manhattan as well. Um, this is my home forever. And um, so I care very deeply about the safety um, and uh, freedom of all people here in Manhattan to live their lives, to exist, to be able to sleep, to be able to walk their dogs late at night as I do, you know, my, my family's here. This is a place that, that matters so deeply to me, but I, um, I think that there is a way to do this and to keep Manhattan safe um, that isn't locking people up, that isn't additional policing and incarceration. And if the status quo were working, then we wouldn't be seeing any crime um, because that is what everyone has been doing. It's been punitive and carceral, and that is just not the answer. And we have this huge once in a lifetime for some of us opportunity um, to make this transformative change and to get a public defender into the DA's office. And so would be honored to receive your support between now and June 22nd. Thanks. Thank you. And finally, uh, Ms. Farhadian Weinstein. Thank you. Uh, thank you for hosting this forum on real life issues. Frankly, after a lot of uh, theoretical and academic discussions, it felt really good to come down to earth uh, and to talk about what this office really means in people's lives. And I, you've seen some of how I think, and I want to pledge to you that if I'm elected, I will collaborate with you. I will take the things that we talked about tonight Seriously, I will work on solutions, not just describing the problems, uh, and that I'm not afraid to use the power of law enforcement in different ways to actually deliver on safety uh, and to say that, you know, all of us are entitled to live um, with the, without some of the menaces that we've talked about tonight, uh, like those bikes. It's really meaningful for me to hear reflected back here. What I actually, these bikes are actually now all over the city. Um, you know, you asking in a very reasonable way for a solution, we owe you that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Tanya, I'll turn it back to you for uh, ending our Three and a half, no, now four hour call. <laughs> Listen, I, I want to say that I am so appreciative. It's competitive to get you all because it's so many, there are so many forums, there are so many times you're trying to navigate to make sure you all can get to as many people as possible. We really appreciate you. We don't get to hear from you all at all up here. And I know that this wasn't, you know, we didn't have the whole, you know, uh, two hours, an hour to talk, but. We, we, did have, we did get to some really substantive questions and I do appreciate you. And we want to, as a task force and as a community, find more ways between now and election to get to know you a little bit better. So, you know, I'll reach out to you about that, you know, ways that, you know, maybe, you know, written question, answer, things that we can communicate with our community to get to know you a lot better. Because I really want this community to understand to really start to engage with you all more. Um, and so thank you so much for joining us. Um, apologies that we ran over, we started late, we were waiting for you know, candidates to come on and they were coming from other events. So you were wonderful. We appreciate hearing from you. The community thanks you and we will be in touch. Thank you so much. And to the people who are attending tonight, uh, thank you so much. We will be, just so you all know, we will be talking to the mayoral candidates and the candidates for comptroller. Uh, that's coming up and we will send everybody information about that. Um, so thank you. Uh, we really appreciate you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. And I, I'm, 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 I'm so grateful to you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. I know yeah. it's a long night, an even longer night for you than it was for us. <laughs> We need it. People hung on, though. You know, they hung on, so no, we no. need it. Uh, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody who was joining us in the audience. Thank you. I hope it was helpful. Thank you, everybody. We will be in touch about the the other yeah. one, part two, which will be shorter. <laughs> I have to wait.
just three minutes. I just wanted to.